Good morning. Good morning. I greet you in the name of Christ, and we're glad that you're here this morning in this rainy, cool day. Before we begin worship, there are a few announcements I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, the beautiful flowers up on, on the stands here were given by Elwyn and Carolyn Studer in celebration of their 78th wedding anniversary this coming Thursday. Blessings to them. That's so terrific. <laughs> um, down under the light of the church, the, the youth will be helping today with uh, hanging up the greens. And immediately, uh, that will be immediately after worship service today. And they will also be having pizza. We're still continuing the Bring Your Own Bible on Wednesday evenings uh, via Zoom. But we are on a break this week, Tyler says, because of Thanksgiving. All right, so next week. And that's at 7, correct? 7 o'clock. Uh, poinsettia author, uh, uh, orders are to be submitted to the office by December 1st, and there will be arrangements to pick those up at an appropriate time later. The blessing box is still available to make donations in this time of need. People are reaching out and using that, which is a wonderful thing, too. And the mint tree will be uh, taking donations. There will be a bin outside of Kristen's office. And you can bring those in Monday through Thursday, 8 to 11 a.m. And that will run between November 29th through December 20th. And I believe Tyler has a couple announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On Christ the King Sunday. What a beautiful Sunday it is. Uh, the first announcement I make with a heavy heart. Uh, our session has determined that this will be our final in-person worship service for the foreseeable future because of Lake County's particular explosion of COVID-19. And since the weather is going to get drastically colder, we won't be able to worship with our windows open like we've been able to do so. So today is our final in-person worship until we are able to determine that it's safe to return in-person. We will communicate more about that this coming week after tomorrow's session meeting, but uh, we will, of course, continue to worship, and we'll continue to connect through worship in the virtual and mailing ways that we have been doing so, even while we've been meeting in person. So again, it's a heavy heart. We're approaching Advent and Christmas, and we will be doing so worshiping fully, spiritually connected with our remote and mailing options. And it'll be different, and we will do it. We'll be flexible, we'll be joyful, we'll be God's children worshiping in the ways that we can. So we will communicate more about that after today and after tomorrow's session meeting. And I know that you all will worship with us as you can, and we will all do so in the ways that we can. The second announcement, sorry, is that we will be having a congregational meeting on December 13th. And of course, that is complicated by the fact that we will be doing things remotely. Uh, but we need to finalize nominations for 2021 for our boards and ministries and committees. So we'll give more information as that time approaches on how you can participate uh, virtually or by phone for that congregational meeting. So the announcement has been made, it's actually three weeks prior, the Constitution says we need to do so two weeks prior, but we are getting it up there since you all are here. So congregational meeting, December 13th, uh, it will be immediately after we broadcast our virtual service, so probably around 11.30 that day. All right, let us worship. Let us listen now to the peace of Christ. Christ's peace is with us always, no matter where we may be. And so Christ's peace is with each and every one of us in this moment. Let us take it in, and let us really feel it. If you're able, please stand now where you are, look around, 
and make the signs of Christ's peace to each other. of the wonders of your creation. 
we fail to appreciate the brilliance of your children. We live our lives as though they are chores to get through, rather than gifts to enjoy. Help us to transform our negative attitudes into attitudes of gratitude. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our King, we pray. Amen. For you, 
as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that, with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And our gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Listen to the words of our Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today's sermon is entitled, The King of Love. Back in September, our session voted to become part of the Presbyterian Church USA denomination's Matthew 25 initiative. Hopefully you have seen a bit about this in the larger view and in other communication from the church and in the pamphlets that you would have picked up with your bulletin today. As you have received information on this initiative, Perhaps you have scratched your head a bit or shrugged and wondered, what is this? 
Well, you're in luck because we're going to get into it. The last two weeks, we have had readings from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. From two weeks ago, you may recall the first passage in the chapter, the story of the bridesmaids and their lamps of oil, and the urging that we should be prepared for the arrival of Jesus at any moment of any day. We can think of this as a call to congregational vitality, a call to be a community alive with love and joy at all times, even in these times, even in the times we are about to approach, in the ways that we worship, in the ways that we serve the world, and in the ways that we live life together, connected in whichever, whichever ways we can connect. And then last week we did a deep, deep dive into the second passage of the chapter, that difficult descriptive parable of resistance with the enslaved man burying Caesar's money and then only giving to Caesar exactly what belonged to Caesar. We can think of that part of the chapter as a call to resistance, as a call to dismantle structural racism, the enduring legacy of white supremacy that led to our own country's sordid history of slavery and our ongoing systems that give structural power and privilege to white people over and above other people, and especially people of color. We can also think of this passage as a call to resistance, as a call to eradicate systemic poverty, a call to challenge the economic policies and realities that keep the majority of the world trapped in poverty, while the Caesars and Pharaohs continue to get richer and richer. And now we have today's reading, the crowning jewel of this remarkable chapter, providentially coming to us on Christ the King Sunday. In this final passage of the chapter, we hear a prophecy of the Son of Man coming with the angels to sit upon the kingly throne of glory. It is an image of breathtaking power. Seated upon the throne of glory is the great King of all the universes, the very Son of God and Son of Man. Surrounding him are all the angels of heaven, waiting upon him and standing prepared to do his bidding. And before him are gathered all the nations of the world, all the people of the earth. Really, you don't get any more immense or powerful than that. In this scene of such immense majesty, what does the king of the universes do? Does he shake his scepter and demand obedience? No. Does he rattle his saber and call for a conquering war? No. Does he beat his chest and brag and boast about his mighty deeds? No. Does he raise his goblet and command adoration from his subjects? No. So what does he do? He hearkens back to the image of the Good Shepherd, the image of a king most famously embodied by David, who was beloved by God. 
The image so beautifully rendered in today's passage from the prophet Ezekiel. I, myself, will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. Yes, this is the king of the universes who sits on the throne of glory, waited upon by all the angels speaking to the gathered billions. A good shepherd reaching out to his beloved sheep, calling them into the inheritance of a father who loves them. The inheritance of the very kingdom over which he is king. A kingdom prepared for them from the very foundation of the world. Picture it with me. The assembled billions from all the nations of the world gaze up at this mighty king seated upon his great throne of glory waited upon by the very angels of God. And as he speaks, their collective jaws drop in consternation. In the immensity of it all, in all that he represented, how could his words make any sense? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Huh? How could this be? How could it be possible that this mightiest of sovereigns ushering in the end of the ages was hungry, was thirsty, was a stranger, was naked, was sick, was imprisoned? In the passage, in their confusion, they dare to speak up. They dare to ask him directly about the source of their consternation. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? In short, how could this have even been possible with a king such as you? And in response, that mighty king before them says the most astounding thing of all. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Maybe at this point their hearts are open and they get it. Maybe they don't. We gathered for worship today should definitely get it though. We should recognize that this great king on his throne of glory is none other than Jesus son of Mary, stepson of Joseph, born in a barn out of wedlock to a teenage mother, raised in an impoverished Palestinian village under the control of the mighty Roman Empire. This is Jesus of Nazareth, Rabbi to a motley crew of fisher people and day laborers, disempowered by their overlords because of their religion and their race and their class. 
This is Jesus, the healer, who gently lays hands upon people with leprosy and people who are hemorrhaging and people with blindness and people with lameness. This is Jesus, the friend, who spends his time with people possessed by demons and with people outcast because of their professions, professions of sex work or tax collection, and with people shamed because of their bodies, and with people hated because of their gender, and with people excluded because of their language or citizenship status or migration history. This is Jesus, the criminal, imprisoned by the empire, tortured by soldiers, crucified alongside of other prisoners. This is Jesus, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, the cousin brother of John, beloved chosen family of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. This King upon the throne of glory is Jesus who lived, who <clears throat> laughed, who loved, who lost. When did we see him hungry, thirsty, naked, imprisoned, a stranger? That was his life. When the king upon that throne of glory speaks of the least of these, he does not do so pejoratively as we so often interpret it. He does not create a hierarchy and designate a bottom group upon whom he can look down. Rather, he speaks as somebody who has lived as one of the least of these. He speaks as somebody who does not just claim the least of these as family, but who knows with the fullness of his heart that the least of these are his family indeed. And when he speaks of the least of these, he speaks with a deep understanding of the way the powers and principalities of this world have always functioned. The ways of the pharaohs and the Caesars and the slave masters, as we discussed last week. He understands that the powers and principalities of this world function and thrive on systems and structures of evil. Systems and structures that enact constant violence by maintaining economics that keep people in poverty and drawing red lines that keep people segregated, and enacting policies that keep people from health, and building walls that keep people out, and building and locking bars that keep people trapped inside. In short, the powers and principalities function and thrive on creating and maintaining the category of the least of these. Those people who do not have structural power within the system. And so the least of these are the loved ones, the family of Jesus of Nazareth, the least of these is Jesus of Nazareth. The least of these is the great king of all the universes, seated upon his throne of glory, waited upon by all the angels with the billions gathered before him. How is that for a paradigm shift? A complete inversion of the norms and rules of the world. A redefinition of what it means to reign with power. For this 
king's power is in his identity as one of the least of these. This king's power is in his ability to connect, to understand, to know, and so to love. This king's power is in his willingness to give up everything this life has to offer, to give up very life itself for the people, for the least of these. And this king's power is also in the people's ability to connect to him, to understand him, to know him, and so to love him. Sure, they can look up at the throne of glory in awe and wonder. Sure, we can look up at the throne of glory in awe and wonder. But we can also look down and look all around. We can look at each other. We can look especially at the hungry at the thirsty, at the stranger, at the naked, at the sick, at the imprisoned, and see the kings and queens of the cosmos, and see the royalty of the universes. Friends, this is the call of Matthew 25. It is the call to flip paradigms and so to dismantle the systems and structures of evil that dominate this world. It is the call to see royalty where the powers and principalities see the least of these. It is the call to feed, to quench, to welcome, to clothe, to care, to heal, to visit, to liberate, to connect, to join. In short, to love. It is the call to follow a king who dedicated his life and his death and his resurrection to this same love. It is the call to follow a king who was hungry, a king who was thirsty, a king who was a stranger, a king who was naked, a king who was sick, a king who was imprisoned. It is the call to follow the king of the universes, seated upon the throne of glory, upon whom all the angels wait, and for whom all the nations bow. It is the call to follow the king who is the least of these. It is the call to follow the king of love. So come. Will you join me? Amen. As we meditate to our beautiful music, I invite you to come forward. I have a basket with my pledge card in it. I'll stand up here. I invite you to come forward one at a time to give your pledge that commits your offering for the year 2021.
Let us pray. O King of Love, we say a prayer to you this day, based upon the call you have given us in Matthew chapter 25, lifting up those whom you have identified. We pray for the hungry, especially in this season of economic desperation. We pray for the many across the world facing food insecurity and famine. And we pray for those who provide food. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the thirsty, especially as we collectively change the climate and make water a scarcer and scarcer resource. We pray for the many across the world facing water scarcity and other ravages of climate change. And we pray for those who provide water. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those named strangers, especially as violence and poverty continue to force thousands from their homes and into perilous journeys across borders, seas, and deserts. We pray for the many across the world facing displacement and seeking refuge. And we pray for those who provide welcome. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the naked, especially as we face an imminent crisis of mass homelessness in winter. We pray for the many across the world who do not have adequate clothing or shelter to survive the elements. And we pray for those who provide clothing and shelter. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, especially as this pandemic continues to ravage our communities. We pray for the many across the world who are suffering from COVID-19 and the myriad other diseases that plague humankind. And we pray for those who provide care. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We pray for those in prison, especially as we continue to use mass incarceration as a means to control, disenfranchise, torture, and destroy. We pray for the many across the world, and especially in this country, who are incarcerated and effectively enslaved. And we pray for those who visit and those who seek abolition. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for this congregation, lifting up our loved ones in silent intercession.
If you have pledge cards at home, please do mail them in as soon as possible. But we also have our daily offering for the day. So let us give our tithes and offerings in recognition of Christ's kingship. If you are worshiping here today, as always, you can place your offering in the plate as you exit. If you are worshiping remotely, I encourage you to mail in your checks or to take advantage of our online giving options through the website. Now let us take a moment to reflect on stewardship as we hear our doxology. Amen. Mm -hmm. 